Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. Today's episode number is a palindrome, something that reads the same backward as it does forward. But given some of the CVEs we've covered this year, it's hard to tell if AppSec is moving forward at all. Which means, this week we talk with Mike Benjamin from Fastly about how design patterns like templating engines and GraphQL impact and influence the security of application architectures. In the news segment, lessons from fuzzing, insecure designs and OT systems, 11 top threats to cloud computing, state of open source security, and more. Read ahead and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security with Invicti, the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API. With unparalleled accuracy, coverage, and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit securityweekly.com slash Invicti. This is episode 202 and 202 forward and backward, recorded June 27th, 2022. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with someone who isn't backward at all, Mr. John Kinsella. That's just working on a forward and backward joke. It's a uh, good to see you. Happy Monday. <laughs> Happy Monday. Uh, we'll be looking forward to some news and take things backwards soon enough. But first, a couple announcements. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to subscribe on uh, to any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. Mike Benjamin is focused on researching the latest attack methods to ensure Fastly's technologies can provide customers with protections against those threats. Prior to Fastly, Mike was VP of security at Lumen Technologies, where he led product engineering, operations, and the Black Lotus Labs threat intelligence teams. Mike's key focus throughout his 25 years of service provider experience has been creating secure and scalable technologies for his customers. Hello, Mike. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Mike. We're happy to have you here. And uh, as I introduce, we sort of have two different technologies that I think maybe the two technologies, I don't know if they taste great together, but they have some shared aspects and impacts and influences on architectures, I think. So GraphQL templating. Um, let's uh, let, let's kind of start just talking about some of the security aspects of them and and see what they see, see what they we, we start to learn about how developers, security teams are hopefully changing their modern threat models, modern applications in response to them. So GraphQL, for example, I'm just going to start us off with a question about, you know, you've been looking at this, you've seen this in use. How much of it is just still, how, how many teams are still dealing with old school, so to speak, uh, standard vulns like SQL injection? Is that still plaguing us in these in, the, in this realm? Well, I, I think if you look at any web application architecture, ultimately there's backend code parsing some sort of user input to make some sort of decision or read something, write something, change something. And so, yeah, the reality is many of the same web application vulnerabilities that we've looked at for years are still present in this kind of an environment. But they also get changed a bit. There are new things that exhibit when you look at GraphQL as a standard um, that we really need to be uh, interested in and considering as security professionals. So and I think the, the 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 but there possibly could go on to a positive aspect, including just yeah more vulnerabilities to look at, because uh, you know GraphQL probably opens up quite a large attack surface because I think it's one of its premises is that let's just bring all of these disparate disorganized backend data stores under one particular authorization mechanism, which I think on paper in principle that's that idea sounds pretty good. But what about the execution there? Is this sort of, are we just shifting complexity from 
old school prepared statements into new school complex keeping track of authorization issues? What are, what are some ways to think about, you know, the a, a positive reasons to adopt GraphQL while doing so securely? Yeah, so I, I think it's important to answer that question by starting with why are developers going to be beginning to use this or have they been? And part of it is they can be much more precise in the question they ask and get less data back. And that's really beneficial from a performance perspective. If you really didn't need all users, you just needed information about a subset of users and you can refine a query to do that, that can be beneficial. And so you'll see in certain application environments, developers think that this is a real positive shift. So inherent to your question and my answer there is there's a lot of data available from a single interface and that should cause some immediate concern in people's minds. Um, but if we back up and think about a graph, a graph has linked data, linkages between information. And so while you may do authorization that says that user or that API key or that mechanism can get into just this one user's data, realizing that that user's data in a graph may actually have things linked to it or it be linked to other things. And so authorization at the top, authorization that says you can get to that one user's data is not the right way to think about it. The right way to do authorization, and this has been best practices for many years, is to do authorization at the object level. So when you actually go retrieve that user's data, because if you remember what I just said, it's linked to other information. So if each object is doing authorization, you're not gonna have an issue. However, if you're doing upfront authorization, you may get access to a larger corpus of information that's obviously not gonna be a positive thing from a, a data privacy or security perspective. Uh, so, I want to throw so in, it, um, oh, go ahead. Real quick, one clarification on that, Mike. Um, so we, yeah, I've I've looked at using GraphQL a few times, um, and and what I'm sort of curious to hear from your point of view, what you've seen with you know, um, as you guys are using it in your customers, developers are excited about GraphQL. Um, would it make sense to say on that that front end developers or the API consumers are more excited than the back end folk, or are you seeing it um, a little more equal? That, that's actually a really good question. Uh, so anything that makes the front end developers life easier is they're, they're going to enjoy, right? If you think about their <laughs> queries into REST APIs, they have to keep track of all these different endpoints and now they don't in a GraphQL environment. That's going to cause the, some, many of the, the front end folks to be happy. But if you think about back end folks, they're going to be in a position where yes, they have to go maybe rethink things, manage new infrastructure, maybe even rewrite and refactor code. That's going to cause hesitance. But Many backend folks also are tasked with the performance of that API. And so as I talked about, being able to deliver data more quickly, you may actually find some backend folks enjoying it as well as they deliver less data to each API call. They may actually be able to be more performant at the application level. So a, a little bit of the backend as well when it's performance oriented, but yeah, a, a lot of front end folks are, are driving that interest. And the, the reason I'm bringing that up oh, to be, sorry, sorry I'll, I'll shut up after this. The reason I'm bringing this up for our listeners, I think of GraphQL still as a fairly new thing. Um, and, and what I've seen is, yeah, there's definitely that push from the front end. And, oh, man, the last thing I want to do is say the front end people don't care about security. But I, I think it's what you're seeing is this is one of those situations, at least where it's come to in, in my world, is the front end guys want it. Um, once they sort of make a, a, um, a, an argument, I'll say, to management of, hey, look, this makes our life easier, then it's almost like it's, I don't want to say it's put upon, but like what you see is the backend team are, are struggling to try and figure out how to use this, how to adopt it, you know, which frameworks to use, all those type of things. And now we're going to talk about how to secure it. So, you know, for security for security practitioners who are, are listening to us, this is what you're walking into. It's um, it's the guys that are actually creating these very seldom have I seen a shop say on the backend guys first go, hey, let's play with GraphQL before the front end folks do. It happens sometimes, but um, it's it's a a bit of a minefield you're walking into if you're trying to help secure this. So that's what just something to think about as, as we have this discussion, I think. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. When I, and I think it brings forward a, a few things folks just haven't thought about. And, and you mm -hmm. know, as we dove through the topic of how it works, um, so there's a, a feature called introspection of GraphQL, where if you typo a field, it'll make a suggestion back to you and say, hey, did you really mean this other field? And if you think about from an enumeration perspective or an attack surface perspective, 
being able to have the endpoint actually suggest to you its actual schema uh, can be dangerous. And so that's one of the recommendations we have is to turn off introspection when you're past your development phase, when you're in a production environment, uh, unless you intend for the schema and all of your backend data formats to be readily available. Um, you know, just not making them open and that easy to get at, it could be a positive step. And that's something that's maybe different than a lot of other APIs that we're used to uh, hardening or securing. Yeah, I think I, I, part of what I hear in John's question, too, is that that idea that you've got a, a one to many mapping, if you will, from the front end to many potentially very different back end data sources that could be SQL back ends, no SQL back ends, could be other additional just REST APIs. And those can have very, very different different and disparate authorization models as well. And Mike, you also mentioned often teams end up having to do some refactoring, some rewriting in order to adopt GraphQL. And it sounds like it's the backend teams that that responsibility falls on to rather than just dropping in a, a new JavaScript framework on the front end to be able to query this. So as you see this work happening, and you're talking about introspection just now, how do you approach this from a threat modeling perspective so that you can also have that security in mind that says rather than just, we need to make sure we can hook up so this data, these all of these fields are available, we also need to know what could go wrong. So. You know, what, what do those conversations look like with the developers that you've seen? Yeah, it, and so one of the fun things that I like doing in threat modeling is actually asking the people to build the technology, how would you get at the back end? Where would you poke? What, where would you find the weakness in what you've designed, you've developed, you're, you're monitoring, you're reacting to? They tend to have some great insight into where they know they have old code, where they didn't think through a problem adequately to meet a deadline, they know where a lot of those weaknesses are. And so if you map that threat modeling question set back to GraphQL, um, asking them, you know, where are you unsure of your authorization model? Where do you have data that maybe sits under a, a, a single key, so to speak, um, that shouldn't, right? And so the, the example that you'll see in a lot of people that write about GraphQL is always social networks of information. And so I may be able to have the authorization to see who's on this, this uh, meeting here, this discussion, but not see your pictures. Well, so if I directly query your pictures, I can't get at them. But what if I say, tell me the users and the linked pictures, I may be able to get at them. So the picture object needs its own local authorization. So being able to go down and talk to the, the developers to say, where did you implement in a mindful and design-oriented way your authorization down to the specific data types and objects um, will tend to glean um, some sort of shortcoming in what they've implemented. And that you, you mentioned refactoring, rewriting code to implement GraphQL. While that scares a lot of developers, it actually can be a positive thing. Think about all the tech debt you can finally address. Think about the authorization model you know wasn't built right six years ago when you stood it up as a REST API. And so it can also be a positive thing to just go back and review and design in a thoughtful way that type of implementation. Yeah, now I want to take a moment to sort of kind of do an, uh, maybe an exercise and compare and contrast here. We talked about GraphQL and have a feeling that it's a emerging technology, if you will. I'm not sure exactly how old it is, to, whether it's fair to call it emerging, but still a, a new design pattern versus template injection. If we look at specifically at something like Java, OGNL, not necessarily new, not necessarily um, in a good light right now from the, from the application security perspective. So let's talk about kind of shift or bring that onto the table as well in the sense of how have you seen refactoring or old implementations of uh, Java applications relying on OGNL, struts, things like that, and their reactions, their considerations with uh, application security here too. Yeah, if you think about the vulnerabilities we've had over about the last seven months, I'll say, um, relating to Java and some sort of template language, um, I think everybody knew of Log4j, the uh, confluence vulnerability uh, from Atlassian or, or in Atlassian solutions came out two or three weeks ago. Um, we had a, a resurgence of the struts vulnerability. We had some issues with Spring uh, a couple months ago. These things were all template injections. And so to your point, uh, there are a lot of Java web apps still sitting out there. A lot of folks wrote a lot of things in Tomcat. And they, they, they're out there and they're doing important things for businesses. And sometimes they're part of commercial solutions as well. And so 
Unlike GraphQL, where we can talk about the excitement of, hey, maybe you could get easier front end development or faster performance, and we have positives saying, hey, go rewrite all of your Java applications to get rid of any use or risk from templates. It's a much harder conversation to go talk to folks. But I, I think it's important right now as security teams that we look at each of these individual problems not as individual problems, but as a group, we have a template injection problem in web applications that we should be thinking at a higher level rather than reacting to the patching of each individual item. And so the, the question I would pose to folks is, um, what are you doing about template injection in general within your environment? Not how did you address one of those many individual roles? So, yeah, so it sounds like going beyond just making sure you're up to date on patch levels. It's more of, I think I'll, I'll use the term uh, addressing the attack class of template injection. So uh, since we're the host and you're the guest, I'm going to turn it around with a question for you again. Um, you know, thinking about GraphQL injection or perhaps GraphQL uh, broad authorization grabs as well as template injection, how have you seen developers deal with that? Or what, have, what What constructive approaches have you seen in terms of trying to tackle those particular attack classes? Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I'll talk about uh, template injection first, because that's what we were just speaking about. Um, mm -hmm. First is uh, the respective language. I, I, of course, gave you a bunch of Java examples, so but I don't want to claim that that is the only place template injections exist. Um, how do you look at the fact that they're even available within your code? Are you using the features that that templating language uh, affords you? Is that even a part of your application? And do you have within your respective runtime, your respective language and ability to shut it off? Just turn it off and don't use it, right? This is the, the age old question about um, scripting languages in you know, office documents. Can you just turn it off? And so that's a question that, that I think people should ask themselves first. Next is, do you have a way to detect the usage of those individual template language uses? Many of them follow very similar syntactical formats, very similar um, language mechanisms in order to be used. Can you detect them? Can you identify them, log on them, block them, filter them, whatever's you know, right for your applications? Um, but rather than, can I detect the very specific Java function that was called in the last exploit? because that's not a necessarily a proactive mechanism. It's very reactive to the last vulnerability class. And so, so that, uh, I'll pause there on template injection. Any, any questions to follow up on there? <laughs> no, I think uh, I, I like the point you made because especially with log4j, everyone was reacting with, well, let's look for those dollar sign curly braces and you know these individual patterns. And then they're slowly discovering that JNDI in particular has a lovely expressive language behind it. So you know it's really hard to build regex-based uh, countermeasures detection for these because attackers and can be more clever just using the templating themselves. But I think if I do have a question there, sorry, more of a comment than a question, obviously. If I do have a question there, it's probably around going back to the idea of do the benefits outweigh the liability of using the templates in the first place? I think on GraphQL, it sounded like there is some development effort that's necessary, but the benefits of tying together a lot of data stores and being able to return only the fields you requested rather than large blobs, that sounds like a good benefit to me. Templating I, I'm always hesitant, leery of, is this sort of a, a legacy application problem? And we have better, different solutions for modern apps, like JavaScript layer-based templating. Yeah, I think you're, you're asking the exact right question. And and even if there's an application environment that absolutely needs it, great. Let, let's uh, whitelist that application, configure it differently, let it do what it needs. But that doesn't mean it should be the base standard. It doesn't mean it should be available to all applications by default. I, I think your, your question is spot on. Um, and, and to your point on GraphQL, I think the, the vulnerabilities that we've seen thus far are not in the use of GraphQL as a query mechanism. It's in how data is delivered back and how it's represented. And so there are some best practice items and, and it's really nice. Uh, you'll see in a number of the GraphQL frameworks, they've begun to just implement by in base packages what the best practice mechanisms are. So turning off introspection, 
Um, some of them have, have a really interesting uh, view where you can actually pull up a graphical view of the entire schema and walk through it. It's really nice for a developer, but again, probably not something you want to turn on in production for the, the internet at large to see. And again, many of those frameworks are now turning it off by default. So we're seeing the, the frameworks that people are using begin to use the right mechanisms. And now it's down to the developers to think about the authorization mechanisms that we've talked about a few different times. Uh, and of course, there's other items. It's it's another socket on the internet. And so there are DDoS attacks that can be launched at it. Um, and, and we started off at the very beginning with the question of uh, input validation, which is the same web vulnerabilities we've always known can still exist and are the downstream logic uh, mechanisms implemented in a way that look for cross-site scripting, look for SQL injection, look for all the things that we know we should be watching for in web applications. Yeah. You mentioned for the introspection, building the graph from a security perspective, or even I'm kind of my head's going in the direction of a, of a logging and visit security visibility, if you will, with GraphQL. Does that introduce some either additional uh, benefits that you can have better visibility into just what is being requested? And here I'm thinking visibility in order to identify attacker behaviors, malicious activity, or is there just or is there something different here that developers have to keep in mind in the sense that the defaults aren't as uh, as verbose, or you're or or there actually is more complicated to be able to have visibility into just what's going on in these within these individual queries. Uh, so I'll unpack the question. I, I think the the fundamental question of does this afford us greater visibility or do we lose it um, comes a lot down to the implementation by the respective team, by the company, by their, their environment. We see a real big standard around things like API gateways becoming more and more the norm of how people deploy APIs. And that can be a really positive thing from a security perspective because now you have a inventory because it's all in one place. You can enable a logging standard at that particular HTTP hop. And so GraphQL is no different. If an organization is placing all GraphQL endpoints in a uh, central place or at least a commonly deployed um, way, they can enable the right level of logging within that, get the right visibility and have it. If every developer is standing up their own endpoint and standing up their own reverse proxy and standing up their own world, then visibility starts to become fragmented. So I, I think that becomes very similar to most other um, web endpoints or public facing application endpoints is if it's done right, it can be a great thing. And so if we can encourage teams to, again, think about this in a holistic way, take advantage of not continuing their legacy tech debt or, or mechanisms that didn't give visibility, this can be a great time if people are switching code bases or switching API endpoints to say, let's gain our visibility now while we're in that code or in that system architecture. One of the reasons I asked about that visibility is that uh, you mentioned performance earlier on too, and performance is very much a key um, mindset of SREs. And they're looking at, you know, how what, what's our availability, what's our resiliency, what's our performance of this endpoint, and how can we know this by looking at logs? In, in this world of SREs either being part of, whether it's the, the template side of things or GraphQL, have you seen some lessons that they are teaching AppSec teams um, in, in that sense of either whether it's how to build better logs, how to gain better visibility, or surprising areas that might be that uh, where visibility brings a um, more information to a security questions, to things like, oh, I didn't know we could see that, or that's actually pretty helpful. I didn't think of looking at X, Y, or Z. Uh, so one of the things we've spent a lot of energy on at, at Fastly is thinking about this exact problem. And so how do we take security folks that know how to secure things and SREs that know how to deploy, manage, monitor things and, and make that a little easier? And so to, so to your question, one of the things that actually is the security folks asking the SREs, how do we make this idea of visibility scale? How do we make it automated? How do we make it baked in? And so working with them to make it the standard and showing them that the visibility that you can get from a security perspective can afford a huge benefit on the performance side as well, right? So if I know um, this same query is being ran a thousand times in a five minute period, from a security perspective, we might be concerned about somebody enumerating data, somebody abusing something. We're, we're interested in those, but the SREs may be in a position where they see that wow, they're, they're hammering a inefficient mechanism I have on the back end. Maybe I can cache that data. Maybe I can 
upgrade or scale out that system or whatever it is the constraint might be hit. And you might actually end up in a situation where because the two parties are working together, the SREs may actually remove some of those reliability and abuse mechanisms before the security team even knows they're there, before they're even ready to react to them. And that's really the best world, right? The central security team having to be the only place everybody figures out how to resolve these things is not a positive way to scale. Getting those SREs involved and getting them into the system design, the application deployments, uh, and then the remediation is a huge, huge benefit to security at the, at the end of the day. That is, on that aspect, how have you seen organizations be successful there? Because there can be um, just, uh, you know, oh, I need to show up in more meetings or who needs to be in this meeting or you're only in the design phase. So I'll do some threat modeling and then the SREs will come back the later phase and focus maybe perhaps more on the ploy and maintenance. Um, and I, I maybe exaggerating a little bit, but for the purpose of there's a lot of moving parts here, and you said AppSec isn't, the, or security isn't the central organizer here or the central point. Um, I guess, tell us a bit more how you've seen different orgs approach that and done it successful at scale. So obviously this is a massive spectrum. You have at, at mm -hmm. one end security teams that are uh, throwing audit papers at people and, and not doing much more. And at the other end, you have people um, that the SREs have actually developed many of the standards collaboratively with security where the SRE drove the, the conversation. So everybody sits somewhere in that spectrum. So the, the, the recommendations that, that I've seen work well with some of our customers and the discussions we've had have been around show up with the problem you are trying to solve to the folks that own the technology. And so if an SRE owns the platform and the technology and you say, I'm trying to get logging visibility to all API endpoints, regardless of technology. How do you think we might do that? SREs, one, like they're, they're engineers. They like solving problems. They like designing technology. Um, two, they like getting it done in a proactive way. And so if you can describe how at some point there may be an incident that you need to show up and make them drop their work and go find data for you, that sounds bad. They're, they like their world predictable. They like to be designing, not reacting. And so the conversation that says, I'm trying to solve a visibility problem, trying to do it to increase security, but it also could help you with your performance metrics. It could also help you not have to react in the future and let them help. Let them help with the design of what that technology stack looks like and make it a collaborative thing. And that more than any other aspect um, tends to be the item that helps is come with the problem and work collaboratively with the folks that own the technology. Now, now I'm going to I'm going to pepper you and make this even more progressively difficult. How does this change now with uh, the difference between designing a new GraphQ, you know, a, a new service that's going to use GraphQL versus your ten year old legacy system that's you know sitting on struts that nobody really owns. Um, you know, these are. They, they can have the same challenges uh, of in just at the high level from security, but um, those conversations might be a little bit different. Does that legacy, how does that legacy aspect influence this type of collaborative approach or that appeal to better performance, better insight onto, you know, just the, your, what you need from an SRE perspective? Yeah, I, I, it's obviously a lot easier to have a conversation with somebody who um, is actively working on redesigning something. That's why I mentioned it's, it's a great time right. to talk about authorization right. models. In the development process, people are much more open because that's the business priority or that's the engineering priority or wh whatever the item is, you're following the existing prioritization of people's work. In the other scenario you described, you're showing up with a threat or um, if we use template injection as the example, you're showing up and saying, hey, we have a class of vulnerability in a bunch of applications you all haven't touched the code base in in five years. It's a much more difficult conversation for people. And so um, thinking about it, maybe the solution to those things is not at the code level. Maybe it's at a mitigating control that sits in line. And so maybe it's a WAF. Maybe it's a, you know, we talked about DDoS. Maybe it's a DDoS mitigation. Maybe it's something that is not about the ultimate scale out with modern development methodologies, but maybe an external control really needs to be used to help uh, lessen the, uh, the potential impacts. And so Again, the recommendation about how you approach that doesn't change drastically. It's, hey, SREs, I have a problem. You've all had to drop what you're doing quite a few times in the last six, seven months and go patch things. Maybe together we could think of a way to 
to do this differently so that we don't have to interrupt you. And so is there an external control we could have? Because we know you're not going to go rewrite all of those apps tomorrow. That's not a realistic outcome. So can we do something else to minimize the impact? And then there's, of course, a slew of other recommendations security perspective in terms of least privileged access for the systems and um, minimizing what access to what data exists within those systems. And so shrinking and shrinking what the impact or reachability to what one of those items with legacy code on it, uh, code on it has of course, is another positive way to just say, we know we're taking a little bit more of an elevated risk by not having redesigned this from scratch. Let's lessen the impact if something were to happen. Yeah, yeah that's, um, it, it sounds like a lot of familiar common, common approaches that um, hopefully people can adopt. And it goes back to, you'd mentioned just with uh, API gateways, getting an inventory of your of your of your apps or an inventory of your APIs where they are. So I guess a an inventory of all of your legacy applications is probably helpful here as well. Something that that is easier said than done, however, unfortunately. Um, in, in terms of you know, we know we should. I think it's I, I guess part of that, you know, my mind is also goes to we know we should be doing this, but there, let's throw in that time dimension. When should we do this? Or pr how do we prioritize this? And this leans to how do we prioritize either that refactor, that terminate the legacy, rewrite the legacy, or just drop that external control on top of it? Are, are there certain things you've seen that are better ways to seed that conversation, better ways to useful metrics to to get more consensus on making one of those prioritization um, decisions over time? It's a great, great question. Um, and I think if we all had the perfect answer, we could all retire tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you what I've seen this work with our customers, though. And, and for a lot of them, it's actually just creating a standard around the that external control and saying, why don't we just deploy this for every application? Some you'll be very strict in your enforcement. Some you'll be very, uh, you'll deploy near zero enforcement. You'll use it as a logging and a visibility mechanism. However, if it becomes a, the standard in the way everyone thinks about deploying every technology in the company, it comes a little easier, right? You don't have one-off systems and have processes to decide, are you a legacy app or a not? You just have a, hey, this is how we deploy technology in our company. That makes it easier. Then the discussion on, great, what is the next level of risk we can address by refactoring code? It becomes a little bit easier of a conversation. It becomes more of a maturity discussion or a how do we help discussion than it does a hair on fire, this system will be compromised if you don't do X kind of conversation. And we, we all know that security folks coming in the room and saying those things doesn't tend to get people in a positive, excited response mode, they get, they get in a defensive mode, they get in an avoidance mode. And so changing the conversation to, hey, let's deploy one thing one way, then we'll be here to help you with the rest of this can be a real positive thing in changing the dynamic of that conversation. Yeah, in the spirit of it definitely, uh, it, it very obviously did not lead in with, speaking of Log4j, the, the example of, well, look at what all the attackers are doing. Look how Everyone is now scanning for this. If you put, you know, it, you, it'll a vulnerable log4j will be discovered probably within minutes, and a lot of probing payloads will be discovered will be coming in within a couple more minutes after that. Um, so yeah, it does sound like a, a healthier approach. I think um, trying to trying to wrap up or, or you know what the, some of the areas we've we've jumped around quite a bit. Some technologies, GraphQL templates, um, the broad vulnerabilities concepts behind them, authorization weaknesses or t or the lack of least privilege authorization within GraphQL or just obviously the template injection. Do you see some particular, here, here's a looking forward question, do you see some particular technologies or shifts, whether they are in the practices side of SRE, DevOps, or some additional technologies that you think um, are, are going to be are, are going to be positive in, to benefits to security as they are adopted more often or as you know just do whether it's just like that rewrite into GraphQL or some other type of tool that is that helpful control for legacy systems or modern ones yeah so th there's a few different things here um, I think the the first is that we see a massive reduction in exploitable endpoint logic, or I shouldn't say endpoint, um, 
end application logic when people are developing their code in the modern frameworks that are available. And so if somebody starts their IDE up with a blank screen and starts writing an API endpoint or starts writing their web application, they're not taking advantage of 10, 20 years of frameworks in their respective language that knows how to stop the vulnerability types that, that you might see. And so starting with just developing in the, the web app frameworks that exist that mitigate many of the, uh, the legacy threats, we'll, we'll say, um, it's a huge step forward in minimizing what's available to an attacker. The next is that we do see WAFs as a benefit um, when they can understand the context to an application, when they can parse the exploit, when they can parse the template and see if it's a, a malicious one or not. The ability to uh, look at that from an external control perspective in a broad way is, is a real positive mechanism. Um, but the next is, uh, I, I hate to say the rest, look a, a little boring. They look like inventory. They look like logging and visibility. They look like those things that we we know we need to do that not every application and every environment does. Um, but the, the one trend that we see within that umbrella that's been real positive is people thinking about APIs more and more as a first-class citizen rather than a weird thing that sits off to the side. And so that can be to, uh, to the harm of folks if they're not thinking about it as something that is core to their security program, core to their visibility, core to their SREs operation. Um, more and more applications work off of API. And while the developers have often made that shift, in many cases, the inventory systems or the security visibility or other things maybe didn't make that leap in, in everyone's environment. We're seeing more and more of uh, of the environments and customers we speak with, acknowledging that and, and joining that shift, which is a real positive thing. Th that is positive. And even if secure, even if some of the important parts of security are boring, uh, you've been very far from boring, Mike, and uh, helping us talk through the, these aspects. I want to thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to thank John and thank all of our listeners. If you'd like to learn more about Fastly, visit securityweekly.com slash Fastly. And with that, we're going to take a quick break and return with news of the week. 